verses like this as kind of like, oh, it just happens. Anytime innocent lives are taken, especially the lives of young girls uh, at an event like this, it's just, it's just tragic. And we continue to scratch our heads and try to make sense of events like what happened in Manchester. And, and we just sit there and we get depressed and we get doubtful and we get discouraged. And yet, what always happens is that beauty rises from the ashes, right? Did you hear the stories of the men and women of Manchester, England, rising up together to take care of the people who did manage to get out of this event? Did you read about the stories of the neighbors that live around the arena where the event took place, opening their homes to total strangers, saying, here's my bed, here's my refrigerator, have what you need, take what you want, we are here for you. And all of a sudden, beauty from ashes happens right before our very eyes. That, that there's something that the enemy has deemed for destruction and for discouragement, that God somehow rallies people together to say, we are a village, we are a community, we are family. And all of a sudden, Manchester comes together perhaps like they've never come together before. Is that not awesome? God is able to turn mourning into laughter. He's able to turn mourning into dancing. Joy comes in the morning, oftentimes after heartbreak and heartache, and yet we've seen it on display. Even Ariana herself messaged all her fans and said, I'm coming back to Manchester to do a follow-up show so that we can heal and we can still enjoy time together. Is that not awesome? And not only that, she also messaged, and I don't know how her agency is going to do it, but she said if anyone needs anything, she is going to help with whatever is needed in bringing wholeness and healing to that community. I don't, I'm not a fan of her music, probably haven't heard any of her music, but I sit there and go, good job. That someone is able to really embody, and I'm not saying she's doing this, but that famous verse that we as Christians tend to throw around at situations, Romans 8, 28, God is able to perform something good Right? For, on behalf of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, he has this amazing around of, tur of turning tragedy into triumph. And we see it right there in front of our very eyes. And don't we need to be reminded of that message? Because whether you're in such a horrific event like that in England, or whether you could face other tragic events in your life, we need to know and we need to be reminded that God is not against us, but he's for us. Amen? That God is a God who cares for us, that he's going to protect us, that he's going to provide for us. And we need those assurances. We need to be reminded of these truths. And so Zechariah comes along, whose name means the Lord remembered. You need to know God's got a good memory. You need to know that God is going to remember those that are his kids. And he's never going to allow anything to befall us that's going to destroy us. He's a God who's for us, not against us. Amen? And so Zechariah is a reminder of this. Because if you remember the historical context, Israel has been released out of captivity. They've been in captivity for 70 years. And they're, they're, they're commissioned to go back home and rebuild their lives. They're going back to their, their houses and, and where the houses once stood and the temple of God once stood. And everything is in ruins. Everything has been burnt. Everything has been destroyed. But they've been commissioned to rebuild. And this is where Zechariah comes along because he is a contemporary with Haggai who we looked at last week. And these two men, prophets of God, encourage the people to get busy doing the work of God because there's no other work more worthy of their time, and I would say our time as well. So what kind of encouragement do we need to do the work of God? How does God reassure us as we're doing His work, especially when there are attacks, especially when conflict happens, especially when there's, there's tragic events that could get us uh, distracted and get our eyes off the prize? What is it that God gives us to keep us motivated to do the work He's called us to do? Here's the greatest answer I can give you. He gives us himself. And if you forget God, guaranteed the path is going to lead to ruin. See, as God remembers us, we ought to remember him. 
And so Zechariah does something interesting, and this is going to be an interesting approach, unlike anything we've done with the prophets thus far. We're going to take about four to five weeks just in Zechariah. And over the next four to five weeks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about 15 portraits of Jesus in the prophet's writings. Because if you remember Jesus and you focus on Jesus, you're going to be okay. Because as he has remembered you, you ought to remember him. And you need to think about the multi, multifaceted, many-faced picture of Jesus that's given us in the scripture. Because many of us know Jesus. We call him Jesus, we call him Savior, we call him Christ, we call him Lord. But you need to know there are hundreds of names for Jesus in the Bible. I tried to find it. I have a volume in my library called A Hundred Portraits of Jesus. And it's a hundred names of Jesus set out in a devotional way so that you can understand the multifaceted ministry of Jesus to his people. Well, Zechariah. I believe, gives us at least 15 pictures of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be consumed with over the next few weeks. And then we'll get to Malachi after that. And maybe we'll share in some Italian food together at that point. But that, we'll deal with that later. So, Zechariah, portraits of Jesus. Zechariah gives us, it's the most messianic prophet outside of Isaiah. It is the, it is the prophet that points to the personal work of Jesus more than any of the other minor prophets. It's the longest of the minor prophets, and it's really worthy of our time. It's the most quoted of the minor prophets in the, in the New Testament. 71 times Zechariah is mentioned in the New Testament. And a third of those is in the Gospels. So here's Jesus and Peter and Paul referring back to Zechariah more than any other prophet. I think it's worthy of our time to really invest in what Zechariah is talking about. And I'm going to tell you, it's probably the most confusing of the minor prophets because there's so much imagery, there's so much symbolism. Boy, I was really pouring over the text this week and going, okay, God, how do you want me to communicate this stuff? Because as you're going to see, even this morning, there are visions and you sit there and go, what do these visions mean? What do these, these symbols represent? I'm going to just simplify it and try to explain as best as I can. These are pictures of Jesus that I want our hearts to, to, to get all excited about. These are pictures of Jesus that God wants us to, to remember. These are pictures of Jesus that ought to comfort us because there's no greater person that's going to bring you hope and encouragement than Christ himself. That's what I firmly believe. Amen? So we turn to Zechariah. You guys there? Chapter 1 is where we're going to start out. And we're going to see this morning four pictures of Christ here in the prophet's writing and so we turn to chapter one and really the first six verses are are a call for israel to return to the lord and this has been a message that we have seen throughout the old testament where god is really disappointed with his people because they've forgotten their god they've they've chosen to live their lives apart from god and they are suffering the consequences of their rebellion and their disobedience and so we see in chapter 1, verse 1, that Zechariah is writing this. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah and the son of Edo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, says the Lord, he says to them, The Lord of hosts, return to me, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now you notice that phrase, Lord of hosts mentioned three times in that one verse. Circle that phrase, Lord of hosts. Some of your translations probably say Lord Almighty. Circle that phrase. 53 times this phrase appears in the book of Zechariah. And what does it mean? It means that God is sovereign over all armies, both good and bad. He's sovereign over all human affairs. He's sovereign over all earthly events. And that his, the vastness of his dominion you cannot comprehend. That God is in charge of everything. And the fact that God's sovereignty is not only put on display in the book of Zechariah, but throughout scripture ought to bring us comfort. That there's nothing that happens without God superintending, being in charge, overseeing, allowing it to take place. There's nothing that happens without God allowing it to happen. 
And so the Lord of hosts says, return to me. And this is where it starts. Any journey with God, any, any hope or encouragement to be found in our lives starts with the return to God. And God says, when you return to me, I promise to commit myself to you. I mean, this is really the, the story of the prodigal son, is it not? The story of that I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. This whole idea that God says, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, that God's invitation is always this, return to me. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all other things will be taken care of. See, there's a priority that we put upon our relationship with the Lord. That whether we're returning to Him for the first time in initial salvation, or we're returning to Him after years or seasons of waywardness and disobedience, as long as you have life and breath, and I think everyone is alive in this room this morning, check your neighbor, make sure they have a pulse. Here's the good news. God whispers to you right now, return to me. You've never gone so far in your life that you're beyond his grace. Amen. You've never sinned so much that you're beyond the reach of his love. Amen. That God says to you, you are battling self-condemnation and self-shame and self-guilt. Stop and hear the voice of the gentle heavenly father saying, return to me. And God says, because when you come back to me, I commit myself to you. That is awesome. And so the writer, Zechariah, starts with this to the people. And he says, don't be like your fathers who ignored the prophets. Don't be like them who actually killed the prophets. I've never felt like my life was in danger. God's truth is hard truth, is it not? I've never felt like, oh my goodness, after delivering that message, there's going to be people who are going to kill me. But they did this in the Old Testament. They were so defiant against the word of God, they killed the prophets. But here, whether you kill me, whether you kill the prophets, here's the great thing about God's truth. It will endure forever. So I'm going to choose to submit to it now, pay attention now, then have to deal with the consequences later. Amen? Who wants to submit to God's truth now? Let's do that this morning, right? So he says, take my words, right? Verse 6, they did not take my words and my statutes, which I commanded them. And they repented in the Lord's of hosts purpose to do in us according to with our ways and our deeds. He has dealt with us. So basically they say we're going to today choose to do what's right. Which gets us to our first point. And our first picture of Jesus. That Jesus is the present one. Look at verse 7. So the first vision happens to Zechariah. There are going to be eight visions in successive order. These are not dreams. Zechariah is fully conscious. He's fully aware of what's happening. And God gives him eight visions at night. Perhaps at night because there's less distractions. Because at night there's probably a better ability to focus. So here comes the first vision, verse 8. I saw at night, behold, a man was standing or riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees which were in the ravine, the red, the sorrel, the white horses behind him. Then I said, Lord, what are these? Like, you're even thinking to yourself, reading verse 8, like, what does this mean? There's There's a rider on a horse among the myrtle trees, and there's other horses with him. Don't you want to also ask God, God, what does this mean? Verse 9, and the Lord Uh, He said, what does he mean? And he said to me, I will show you what these are. And isn't that cool that God says, I will answer your question of understanding. James chapter 1 says, if any one of you lacks uh, wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. Amen? You don't have to be left in spiritual quandary when it comes to questions in life. Uh, The Bible speaks a lot to our situations in our lives, but probably many of us have a lot of questions we never go to God with. And there's one thing that God wants to do is he wants to answer questions that are going on inside your mind, inside your heart, to make sense of his word. Because wouldn't that serve him well as far as glorifying him? And doesn't that serve you well as a follower? God, what do these things mean? So he says, I'm going to tell you what they mean. Verse 10, and the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. 
And they answered and they said, the earth is peaceful and quiet, which is interesting because the people of God would not say that the earth is peaceful and quiet. But this is the vantage point of the enemies of God. See, the enemies of God have had their, their heyday with the people of God. And they're at peaceful and rest, but it is a false peace and a false rest. Because notice what the angel communicates. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord answered. Stop right there. The angel of the Lord, circle that phrase. Anytime you see the angel of the Lord phrase pop up in the Old Testament, here's what I'm going to tell you as far as an interpretive key. That is the person of Jesus Christ appearing in the Old Testament. Here's what's cool. So the angel of the Lord is the very present Jesus before his incarnation in the Gospels, right? You think Jesus came into existence at Christmas time? He didn't. Christmas, Christmas is the celebration of God coming to earth in the form of a man. We call him Jesus, but that Jesus has always existed in eternity past. The second member of the Trinity that we call Jesus makes his appearance in the Old Testament frequently. This is what is called a Christophany. When Jesus appears in the Old Testament, several examples I could cite, one being the, the fourth figure in the fire with Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember they said, we threw three people in the fire, and now we see a fourth figure, one who's shining, whose brilliance is like that of an angel. Well, guess who was present with Daniel's friends in the flames? Jesus. And God sends the angel of the Lord to earth, in his pre-incarnate state to reassure God's people that he hasn't forgotten them, that he remembers them, and there's no greater comfort than to actually have the presence of God with you. And here's what's happening. The angel of the Lord is there. And notice the scene. He sees a, a field of myrtle trees, very common in Israel, and there is this presence of this angel of the Lord in the thick of the myrtle trees in a deep ravine, symbolizing the deep humiliation that Israel has gone through. And basically God is saying to Zechariah, tell the people that even in their deepest humiliation, I am with them in that deep place and I've never forgotten them, but I am ever present with them. Amen? Do we not need to be reminded that God is ever with us. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. And yet there's times we don't feel his presence. Thank God your spiritual journey is not based upon your feelings. Amen? Our feelings are all over the place. Sometimes I feel like I love God. Sometimes I don't feel like I love God. But God is much more objective than that. He proves himself to us time and time again. He has not given up on you, nor will he ever give up on you. I remember there were seasons when my, my first two children were going through these moments where they were fearful and scared that we would leave them. And here's what it looked like. So my daughter would basically follow us all over the house to make sure that she could always keep an eye on us. And there were times when we'd go outside to go get the mail, and she'd be like, where are you going, where are you going, where are you going? And I'm thinking to myself, Riley, what, what are you worried about? Well, I, I don't want you to leave. I'm not leaving. I'm just going to go check the mail. I'm just, I'm just going to go take out the trash. But there was a season where my wife and I are looking at each other going, why is she acting like this? Why is she acting out of fear like we are going to leave her? Well, thank goodness, eight, nine years later, she's not doing that anymore. You want to know why? Because of countless time invested in our relationship with our da daughter, she has known that we will never leave her or forsake her. And now she's like, go. Get out of the house, leave, go do, go do what you want to do. She's like Miss Independent now, right? Because why? Because of the relationship that we have proven over time to her, that we are committed to her, we want good for her, we do not want harm for her, and that we are there and we can be counted on, and we're not going to leave her or forsake her. And I sit there and go, how does God want to work that kind of assurance in our hearts today? How does God want to, to reassure us on a continual basis that he, he, he's going to be with us? He's not going to ditch us. He's not going to forsake us. And I'm going to tell you that that can only come, that confidence can only come when you foster the relationship with him and know him and love him and walk with him and obey him. 
If you neglect God and forsake him, you have no confidence that he is going to be with you. Not that he actually leaves you, but you're not sensing it. Why? Because you haven't given priority to just obeying him at the first. Obey him, walk in righteousness and purity, and you're going to sense the presence of your God. So this is what's said to, uh, to Zechariah. He says in verse 13, And the Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words and comforting words. Highlight that verse. That's good. Because when you pay attention to what God's saying, when you, when you heed his truth, there is nothing but grace and comfort that comes with that. Verse 16, therefore, says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it. Again, the reassurance that God's work is going to get done. So number one, Jesus is the present one. He is present with us in our deepest humiliation. He's present with us in our, our greatest successes. He is always with us. Amen. Second vision, verse 18. Then I lift up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? Again, I love Zechariah. Guy's, guy's honest, right? He's not sitting there going, oh yeah, I know exactly what this represents. What are these horns? Verse 19, so I said to the angel who was speaking, what are these? These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Stop right there. Here's the second point in your notes that Jesus is the punishing one. Jesus is the punishing one. This is probably an aspect of Jesus's ministry that we don't want to think about, but we have to wrestle with because our God is righteous. He is just. Part of his characteristics is is that he's a wrathful God, meaning he will tolerate nothing that vies for his glory. He will not tolerate anything that defies holiness. And so God one day will punish all sin and all wrongdoing. Amen. We need to be assured of this. Why? Because there are injustices abound. We look around us and we wonder, God, how long are you going to act and, and, and just let these things take place? Manchester, England. God, how long are you going to wait until you actually intervene and do something? And so what Zechariah gets a vision of is a picture of horns, which is interesting. But in the Bible, horns always symbolize power and strength. So write that down. Make a little interpretive note in your Bible. Horns equals strength or power. I'm not a hunter, but I've known a lot of guys who are hunters. And I always feel a little emasculated when I'm in their presence, just to be honest with you guys. Okay? Like these guys, you know, talking about their guns, and you look on their walls, and there's a lot of dead animals all over their walls. And I always just feel like, I got a bunch of books on my walls. Can I be included in your club, right? But I do know enough about hunting to know that there are certain trophy animals that are such because of the number of horns they have on their head. Like I knew this guy who, who shot a eight-point elk. All you hunters out there, does that, do you know what that means? That's a big elk. You were going to say something big, something else, elk, but you didn't go there. Thank you for not doing that, Brandon. Um, <laughs> An eight-point elk is a big elk. Would you say that's a powerful animal? Would you say that's a strong animal? It looked huge. It looked like it was coming through the guy's wall, even though it was just its head that was mounted there. But an eight-point elk is a beast of an animal. Why? Because the power and the strength of that animal is reflected in its horns. What Zachariah sees is he sees a picture of horns symbolizing strength and power, but the horns belong to the enemies of God. See, Zechariah is, is being told that these horns are the powers that have come in to destroy God's people or try to destroy them. Look at verse 20. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Now again, I'm not a crafty person. I like watching this old house and shows like that, but I don't, I don't, I'm not going to pose as, a, as somebody who's like, you know, good with tools and wood and, and things like that. But look at verse 21. I say, what are these coming to do? All of a sudden there's the horns and these craftsmen. These are the horns which have scattered Judah, 
so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them. This is the part in the, in the, in the minor prophet Zechariah where we sit there and go, woohoo! Why? Because the craftsmen come in and they're going to destroy the horn. The craftsmen are representative of God's agents of destruction. These are the angels that work for God. They are on assignment to do battle and to punish and to lay waste God's enemies. And we sit there and go, yes! Because at the end, the horns don't have the final say. Amen? In the end, it is God's counsel, it is His will, and it is His resources that are now assigned to do destruction to those that would harm God's people. Can I get an amen from anybody? See, Romans chapter 12 says, we need to be reminded that there's a God who will fight for us. We have a God who will fight on our behalf. We have a God who promises to take care of those that are not only his enemies, but take out their anger against us, his people. And God says this, don't you dare fight evil with evil. Don't you dare fight fire with fire. God says, I will take care of the enemy. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Amen? Don't we need to be reminded of that? Isn't there a temptation in some of us to fight and to, and to lash out? But let me just tell you, you know what? You can lick your lips with anger and vengeance and bitterness, but I'm going to just tell you, leave it in the hands of God because what he's going to do in vindicating his cause and his people is going to be far superior than anything you can do. Let him have it. Amen? So Zechariah is, is among people who have been brutalized. He's among people who have had their homes and the temple of God destroyed. And the temptation of some would be to, to lose hope, maybe to take matters in their own hand. And Zechariah says, do not forget that Jesus is the punishing one. He will come. And the book of Revelation talks about that final day when he will do battle against his enemies. And you and I can sit back because we're on his side, right? We've got him on our side. And he will do battle with his enemies. And there is vindication. So Zacharias sees a picture of Christ being present. He sees a picture of Christ being the punishing one. Number three, chapter two. We have a picture of Jesus as the protecting one. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. So talk about random visions, right? You're thinking like, this guy had some bad Mexican food for dinner before these visions came, right? He, he sees the, the rider on the horse in the myrtle trees. He sees the horns and the craftsmen. Now he sees a man with a measuring line. And I said, where are you going? Verse 2, he says, to measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and to see how long it is. Now, that would be quite a task, wouldn't it? If I said, Adam, can you go measure Phoenix for me? I mean, that would be a lot of work, wouldn't it? But here's the point, is that we shouldn't be consumed with, with the work. What we need to be preoccupied with is the one who's doing the measuring emphasizes one who has ownership and rulership over it all. Jerusalem is this person's domain, the one with the measuring line, hence his ability to measure it. Look at verse 4. And he said to him, run, speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Stop right there. Here's what's being communicated to Zechariah. That as they're going back to rebuild their lives, with their first assignment to rebuild the temple of God, with their second assignment to rebuild their homes and their businesses, they are getting assurance and confidence from the, this, the Lord saying, I am going to be among you and I'm going to protect you. Because the first inclination would be to build your walls, right? Fortify the city, protect yourselves. And God says, don't worry about the walls. I will be a God who will be a wall of fire around you protecting you. Is that not awesome or what? But, but also what I don't want you to miss is that 
if you build the walls, what you're saying is, we're confined now to this enclosure. And God's saying right here in verse 4 and 5, there are more that are going to be a part of your community than you could ever count. There are men and women and animals coming where I don't want you to leave anyone out. And here's a larger theological point that I want to share with you. God is building his church. And the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Amen? That there are men and women still alive right now in our time who have yet to bend the knee to Jesus as Lord and Savior, who aren't officially a part of the church, but guess what? There's still opportunity for them to be a part of the church. Amen? May we never be so narrow-minded to leave anyone out of God's flock. May we not be so narrow-minded to think that God's done. Hey, guys, we're all safe and secure. Give it up. High fives for Jesus all around. We get to go to heaven together. But you are here not only as a recipient of the love of God in Jesus Christ, you're now here as an ambassador and a witness to now go take the message to those who don't have hope in Christ yet. That there is opportunity all around us to let people know that guess what? The church's doors are open. The walls have not been built. And there's nothing you've ever done that would prevent you from being loved by God because he knows every single person through and through. And that's where mercy and grace comes into the picture. That Christ is the protecting one, but yet he's not so protective to say, you know what? You know what? This is done. Go ahead and just rest secure on your laurels. Go ahead and rest secure on the fact that you're in. Just know that God's still reaching the hearts and lives of people. Hence the fact that they are not to build walls. And this is the most beautiful picture of the, of the work of God, that his building is not a building made with bricks and stone and mortar. Amen? That the church is not an institution like this room, right? When people say, hey, Pastor Scott, where's your church? You know what I say? I don't say 1982 North Almond School Road. I don't say that. When people say, Scott, where's your church? I say, wherever the people of God are, that's where my church is. Do you see the mentality that we are the church? The church is not an organization. It is an organism. It is not a building. It is the people of God. Christ is the cornerstone. You are the living stones, according to 1 Peter, right, chapter 2, that we are now being built up in this holy priesthood. Don't you dare think that God's doors are closed and that there are people who cannot get in. How did you get in? That's the question. How did you get in? And you can only point heavenward and say, by the grace of God. Now, my, my, my commission to you is this. Go share it with others. Amen? Go tell others that they can be included because God is protecting his work. He's protecting his people. But with protection, as you see here in this text, comes prospering. And as long as people have life and breath, God wants people to prosper. Look at verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory, which he has sent me against the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. Is that awesome? Some of you are going, I knew that was in the Bible. You just didn't know where it was. Well, now today's your happy day, right? You know why the apple of the eye is important? Because this communicates the most sensitive, the most injurious area of your eye, the most sensitive area that needs to be protected. And what this is saying is that God's people are precious to him and he will do whatever it takes to protect what's precious to him. You're the apple of his eye. For behold, I wave my hand over them, and they will be plunder for their slaves, and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing for joy and be glad, verse 10, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. Awesome. Christ is not just the present one. He is not just the punishing one, but he is also the protecting one because he loves his people And he wants to include more people into his family and part of his kingdom. And we have a responsibility to let people know that there's a God who loves them. No matter where they're at, no matter what they've done, God's grace superabounds in this world. Amen? But that God knows everyone by name. God knows everyone personally. So in Melbourne, Australia, something interesting, I read this story this week. And sometimes there's other places that do crazy things. And I'm not going to say we should do this. 
But there's a community in Melbourne, Australia, that wants to protect its trees. And we're talking tens of thousands of trees. And so what they decided to do is they went out to personally assign each tree an individual email address. So now every tree has an email address, and if you happen to come upon a tree that is damaged or has been hurt in any way, you can actually send an email to the government. They know exactly what tree you're talking about, and it gets personalized service. As a matter of fact, someone actually in the community found out that you could actually send an email to that tree, and someone actually sent an email to a tree saying this, we don't have much to talk about, but I'm glad we're in this together. I mean, think about that. These are lonely people. Got nothing better to do with my time. I'm just going to email this tree. Hi, tree. Thanks for keeping me shady, tree. But you think about, like, that's just crazy. But these people care about the trees and they're willing to go through the laborious work of making sure each tree is protected that is nothing compared to the work god wants you to know that he's doing on your behalf because he loves you he's going to protect you why because you're precious to him he knows your name he knows every hair on your head he knows every issue you are dealing with in your life Nothing scares him. Nothing freaks him out. But what he says to you today is this. I am here and I want what's best for you. Is that not awesome or what? Don't ask him for an email. You got something better than an email. You've got his spirit. If you're a son of God through Jesus, a daughter of God through Christ, you have his spirit living within you. He is closer than you'd ever imagine. And you need to be reminded that you are precious to him. Amen? We need to hear that. So Christ being present, Christ being the punishing one, Christ being the the protecting one. Last thing we're going to look at this morning is this. Jesus is the purifying one. And this is probably one of my favorite scenes from the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Jesus is the purifying one. And I want you to see how people are accepted by God. I want you to see how chapter 3 points us forward in history from Zechariah's vantage point to the, to the work of Jesus on the cross. Verse 1, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Do you remember Zerubbabel, the governor? Joshua, the high priest. Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now stop right there. This is a very unique scene in the scripture. Does anyone know where else we have a scene of of Satan being in the presence of God? Job chapter 1. Something you need to understand about spiritual warfare. Something you need to understand about our adversary, the devil. Something you need to understand about spiritual attacks. Is that they happen, they're real. Peter says the devil's like a a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. But I want you to know something that you don't put the devil on the same level that you put God. The devil is not omnipresent. The the devil is not omnipresent. He's not all omniscient. He is not all knowing. He is not everywhere present. I'm going to tell you something that the devil is on a leash and that leash is held by God and the length of that leash is determined by God and God alone. The devil is God's devil. And too many times there are Christians and there are followers of Jesus who ascribe too much power to the enemy. Now, I don't want to diminish the fact that there are sa- there's satanic activity. It happens. I have been exposed to it. And that's another story for another time, even though my kids clamor to hear stories about this. I, don't, I want them to sleep at night. I don't want them to be waking up in the middle of the night with bad dreams about <gasps> dad's near brush with Satan and demonic activity, right? Take me out to coffee. We'll talk about it later, all right? But the fact is this. Satan obviously has access to God. He's permitted into the presence of the Almighty, which I believe is one of the reasons that at the end of 
the age, there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. People go, I can understand the new earth, but why a new heavens? Because heaven has been tainted with the presence of God's devil. And there must be a purifying to that presence that he's had. But he's allowed to approach God. He's allowed to ask permission. Can I test your servant Job? Well, here is the devil, the accuser. And I want you to know that in the original language, Satan and accuse are the same word. See, the the devil can't create anything. All the devil can do is twist and distort and ruin what God has already created. And he's called the accuser for a reason, because he doesn't speak truth. He only speaks that which is set to destroy or demolish, to try to crush you. See, so many times we are influenced. I don't believe a believer can be demon-possessed, but I do believe believers can be demonically influenced. And too many times we bend our ear to the devil and just listen to his lies. We bend our ear to the devil and listen to his accusations. How many times have you set out to do a great work for God, and there's been that little voice inside your head saying, who do you think you are? God can't use you. You're going to mess up. Don't even start at it you're only going to mess up and we listen to these defeating voices that i believe can be used by the devil to crush our faith to ruin the work that god wants you to be involved in why because we're not listening to the almighty our god our lord our savior we're listening to the accuser so here's the accuser standing at the right hand of the high priest joshua now if anyone has got their life all together it's the high priest joshua isn't it But even Joshua, before the holy God himself, has got something he needs to have taken care of. Look at verse 2. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. I love it. Even before (laughs) Satan has anything to say, the Lord rebukes him. And I'm going to tell you, the devil only speaks when God permits him to speak. I rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen... Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Meaning, Satan, you have nothing to say regarding my work in delivering people. This man who stands before me is my servant. He was in captivity. He was led there. He thought his life would be destroyed. But now he's back and he has been delivered. He has been saved like a brand plucked from the fire. Maybe heated up, maybe burnt a little bit, but not destroyed. Amen? Are we not all brands plucked from the fire? Are we not all maybe at moments in our life feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be destroyed. I'm going to be crushed. But God does not blow out a smoldering wick, but he cups his hand around that wick and gently with his breath breathes us back into life and existence. Is he not the one who says, I will take that broken, uh, that bruised reed and I will not allow it to be broken. I'm going to heal it. I'm going to restore it. This is what God does, right? The enemy can say nothing about it. The enemy can do nothing about it. You need to be reminded of who you are in Christ, not what the accuser wants you to believe about yourself. Because at the end of the day, guess what, you guys? I don't care what you think about yourself. You know what I care about? What God thinks about you. There's a huge difference between the two of those things. Trust me, as one who has served God and one who has failed God, I'm a poster child for second chances. (laughs) I'm a poster child for tenth chances. Don't make me go any higher. I hate numbers, all right? But I stand before you as one who could have chosen to live in a pit of guilt and shame and self-condemnation. But doggone it, I'm not going to listen to the enemy who only wants to destroy my soul. I'm going to listen to God who says, no matter where you've gone, no matter what you've done, I can always use you for my glory and your good. And I say, let's go, God. Let's do it. He is a God who purifies us. He has purified me in Christ so that I can stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Jesus and I still stand before him 
to be purified for all the ways that the world wants to taint me and stain me, guess what? There's nothing the enemy can do to take you out of God's service. That is solely God's discretion. Amen? So here is Joshua. Verse 3, clothed with filthy garments. Literally, he is covered with human excrement. That's really, that's really the description here. And you need to understand that the Bible treats sin as something as disgusting as that. As that. Don't we tend to trivialize sin? Don't we try to make light of it? Like, oh, yeah, he just committed adultery against us. It's okay. Oh, you know, she just murdered. Yeah, she just murdered. It's okay. It's okay. And we, we trivialize sin. God never trivializes sin because all sin is a, an affront and assault to his character. Here's Joshua standing before the Lord covered with human excrement. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him, verse 4. And again he said, see, I've taken away your iniquity away from you and, you, and will clothe you with festal robes. This is what God does for us in Jesus Christ. Right? This is why Jesus is the purifying one. Does he say, Joshua, take off your own robe. Take off those dirty clothes. He doesn't. Why? Because you are powerless to do away with the sin that has enveloped your life. But what God does is he commands his attendants, the angelic hosts under his sovereign control, to say, do for him what he can never do for himself. That is what Jesus does for us, ladies and gentlemen. Lest you think you can take credit for anything at the end of the day, you can take credit for nothing the purifying work of God is entirely His work on the soul of every man or woman in Jesus Christ. All glory goes to Him. And if I have been changed, boy, there's hope for other people. If you've been changed, there's hope for other people. Just this week, I was listening to talk radio like I always do. You guys must think I, I either watch YouTube videos or listen to talk radio all the time. But there's a story about a Christian school who would not allow their pregnant 18-year-old star student to walk in the graduation. This was the, this was the president of the student council, and she made a bad choice, and she got pregnant. And now the school says, you know what? We're going uh, to remove you for your, pre your position of being president of the student council, and we're not going to permit you to walk in graduation. This is a, this class, the senior class, is about 16 kids. So the talk radio had this story and people calling in. And the greatest, the truth that was shared most frequently among all the callers was that, boy, if, if that's what religious people do to other people, I don't want to be a part of that. And I... And I was driving, so of course I don't text and I don't call and I don't do things that are distracting, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know what I mean? But I so desperately wanted to call in and be like, you know what, people, they have to suffer some consequences for their choices, right? And I'm not saying what's right or wrong, what this school did, I'm not citing one, one or the other. But what I'm citing on is this, is that God is a God who forgives and yet that message to our world is, is not being communicated. Because people are thinking, oh, religious people, they're perfect. They got it all together. See, what's being communicated is you make one mistake, guess what? You're not walking. You make one mistake, you're out. One mistake, you're disqualified. One mistake, you are no longer going to serve in that capacity or that role. And I sit there and go, no, my God is a greater God than that. He's a God who forgives us no matter what mistakes we make. Amen? that I wanted to cry out through the radio. No, Jesus offers life to anyone who asks. He will offer salvation to anyone who wants it. And my God is a God, no matter how filthy you may be, says my grace will cover all that filth. Exactly what's being communicated here. God does for us what we can never do for ourselves. All glory be to God. That our God is a God who purifies us. And now that we're purified in Christ, because He is the one who does the purifying work, I want to live my life reflecting the beautiful gift 
of grace that God has given me. I want my choices, I want my work, I want my mind, I want my heart. I want to be compelled by the love that God has set within my heart, knowing that I am a sinner in desperate need of salvation, that I fall short of His glory and His grace, and there's nothing I could do to ever earn it. But yet, some way, somehow, and for some reason, God said, Scott Morgan, I choose to set my love upon you, and now I, once who was blind, now see. Amen? Once I was lost, lost but now I'm found. I have been forgiven. How about you? Are you there? Are you walking in that? Are you living in that? Are you sharing that with others? There's a cemetery outside of New York City. I close with this. On the headstone in this cemetery, there's no name. There's no date of birth. There's no date of death. There's one word on this headstone, forgiven. And you sit there and you ask yourself, whoever lies beneath this headstone, what was it they wanted to communicate to the living? What they wanted to say to the living was this. Don't, don't be, be preoccupied with my name. Don't be preoccupied with my life, when I was born, when I died. But the greatest thing you can know about me is this, that I was forgiven. And I tell you what, I could live with that. I can live with that being on my headstone. I can live with that being the motto of my life. I can live with that being the driving factor of why God has me here. Because if I've been forgiven, anyone can be forgiven. Amen? And that's the beauty of Christ's love for us. He forgives us and He does for us what we can never do for ourselves. And that's why at the end of the day, He gets the glory. Amen? Zechariah chapter 1 through 3. Fun? Yeah? Jesus, the present one. Jesus, the punishing one. Jesus, the protecting one. And Jesus, the purifying one. I think 11 more portraits to go. But it's going to get sweeter. It's going to get richer. It's going to get fun. Amen? Next week, chapters 4 through 6. Until then, let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you are truly, truly awesome. You have given us this time together. And it is a gift. You have told us it is a wonderful thing for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity and in harmony. And Lord, what makes this occasion so special is that it's centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Lord, perhaps there's no greater topic, there's no greater theme, there's no greater thing that we should set our mind on than to think about Jesus who has our everything who is our all in all. Thank you for giving us such a a multifaceted picture of, of Jesus Christ. Throughout the scripture, we have hundreds of portraits of Jesus and they are given to us to comfort and to bring hope and to encourage us. And Lord, I pray that your truth would do exactly that. May your truth get rid of the lies and the falsehoods that we have preoccupied our hearts with. And may your truth truly set us free. Help us to live for your glory. Help us to experience the goodness that comes from that. Help us to lay aside the sin that entangles us and to help us persevere for the one cause that matters and that is you, God. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and have the confidence that you're going to take care of everything else. Thank you for this day. Direct our steps. We look forward to the next time we can be together. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And I just want to just once again... uh